When I do a park review, I usually talk about my experience there and walk you through what I went through step by step. There are a lot of parks out there that I've only been to once, so that kind of reflection works for those parks. But there are others that I've been to a bunch of times, and I think a different kind of review is appropriate for those. And that's why I'm taking my coaster pros and cons format and moving it over to parks. And what better park to kick this off than the one that I've been visiting for 20 years, the one I worked at for eight years, and the one I go to at least once a week. These are the pros and cons of Six Flags Magic Mountain. The first pro is the freeway access. I know a lot of parks that are so far off the main highway that you end up driving through a forest to get there. I'm looking at you, Great Adventure. Magic Mountain sits right off the main vessel that connects the entire west coast, Interstate 5. And I'm not talking about a park like Knott's, which is also pretty close to Interstate 5, but you have to drive for a while on the surface streets to get there. I'm saying it's directly off the freeway. It's a great location, and it's super easy to come and go. The first con is that the park only has one entrance and exit. For a park this size, it's not uncommon to have multiple entrances. Cedar Point and Carowinds come to mind. It would be amazing to have a secondary entrance between Twisted Colossus and Scream. I know this is possible because that's where everyone was evacuated from when the brush fire shut down the park last June. For now, they only have one main entrance to the left of the parking booths, which is really easy for those getting dropped off and picked up, but dreadful for those who actually have to park. And this is the main reason I choose not to drive here most of the time and opt to go on foot or bike. The second pro is the 365 day operation. Magic Mountain has always been a year round park, open every weekend of the year with daily operations from late March through mid September. But in 2018, this was expanded to 365 days a year. The park knows that this isn't ideal for their bottom line. There was a very good reason that they were closed on weekdays in the winter. It's because nobody comes to the park those days because of school and work. Just to open their gates and staff enough restaurants and rides to make the visit worth it is not cheap. And with just a few hundred people roaming around, most of which are probably season pass holders with dining passes, there's no money to be made on days like this. They likely did this so they could fit in along the other Southern California parks like Disney, Universal, and Knott's, which are also open all year. They may be losing money, but for us park goers, it means so many more days where we can go to the park without any lines, or just go over there to use the dining pass any day that we want. I live a few miles away, so it's easy for me to do that any day of the year. The second con is the distance between the parking lot and the park entrance. I touched a little on this in my first con and mentioned how nice it would be to have a second entrance in the parking lot. Even if you have preferred parking, you have to walk the distance of the water park just to get to the park entrance. If you park anywhere else, that trek is even longer and you're better off taking the tram. If you park far enough down the parking lot on busy days, like if you end up over by Scream, it'll take you 20 minutes to get to your car after you exit the park. I even made a video where I'd race Sophie home on my bike since the car was in the middle of the parking lot and I could stash my bike right by the park exit. I lost, but only by a few seconds. I envy those of you that can park right up front, like at Fiesta Texas or Cedar Point. Magic Mountain has one of the more brutal treks from the parking lot to the entrance, with New England and Discovery Kingdom also chiming into this conversation. The third pro is their freestyle machines. Not every park has these, and I really miss them when they're not there, and I have a drink plan or a souvenir bottle. If you don't know what a freestyle machine is, it's a self-serve drink machine where you have over 100 drink choices, and you can mix and match flavors. So you can get Coke or root beer, but add vanilla or lemon or cherry flavoring to it. I have two go-to orders here, Diet Mr. Pib and Dasani flavored water. You can't get the flavored water at a normal soda fountain, and it's the best thing to get at the park because it has no sugar and it only has natural flavors instead of artificial sweetener. I would just buckle down and drink the water they hand out for free, but the water at Magic Mountain is gross for whatever reason. So instead of chugging down high fructose corn syrup or aspartame all day, I have that flavored water option. Even better for Magic Mountain, there are two locations with freestyle machines and they're on complete opposite sides of the park. One is right in front, across from Full Throttle, which have two machines side by side for better capacity. 
and the other is in Studio 6F next to Gold Rusher. With just one machine, the park president said that these are very expensive and they were not meant for amusement parks and the constant use that they get. So I'm just thankful that they have the two. The third con is the lack of cup holders on the ride platforms. Parks like Fiesta Texas and Discovery Kingdom have these shelves with holes in them where you can put your bottle, where it won't have stuff thrown on top of it, and it won't be knocked over. It makes me wonder why other parks don't have the same thing. Magic Mountain does not have a single one of these. Either you stick your bottle into a bin or the side of the station, and it's in a precarious position when compared to those secure drink holders. I believe this is the reason why West Coast Racers makes you dump your drink before you enter the station because they're afraid that the drinks will get knocked over in the bins and destroy everything else around it. Justice League has the same policy, but that's because they want you to ride with your bottle and don't want the ride car getting sticky. With these drink holders, there would be no reason to dump everything out. They don't look expensive, and other Six Flags parks have figured this out, so I don't see the problem. The fourth pro is the lack of rides that require a locker. X2 is the only offender, and at least these lockers are in the station, so you can have your bags and your bottles all the way up until it's ready to ride. And the locker is $1 for two hours. X2 should have bins on the station, but when comparing Magic Mountain to other parks, I have nothing to complain about. Cedar Fair parks often have several of their major rides that don't allow you to stash your bags or bottles in the station, either because the train unloads in a different area or they want to increase capacity. Great Adventure doesn't even allow phones in line for most of their major rides. Magic Mountain has a designated area on each ride where you can put your stuff. On rides like Viper, Full Throttle, and Twisted Colossus, it's a bin. On rides like Apocalypse, Goliath, and Batman, you just stick your stuff on the station floor. I appreciate that the park that I visit the most does not harass or take advantage of its guests with a strict locker policy. But if you could fix this problem for X2, that would be great. The fourth con is the lack of good options on the dining plan. I travel to a lot of Six Flags parks around the country, and I'm always impressed with the variety of meals and snacks that they offer. There were so many great things that Magic Mountain was missing, not because they didn't want to put it on their dining plan, but because it didn't even exist at the park. I would say the only good, unique item on the menu, until recently, was Twisted Witches, where you can get a high quality hot sandwich. In 2019, with the introduction of the Underground, we got the Chicken Coop and Twin Charge Tacos. I'm not a big fan of either of these places, but at least it gave a little variety. The best thing that came with the Underground was Snack Tracks, which finally introduced stuffed pretzels and soft serve ice cream into the park. So this con is improving, but there's still plenty of room to improve. Most Six Flags parks allow you to get a basic funnel cake with your snack plan, and you can add a dollar or two dollars to upgrade or add something more. Magic Mountain does not offer the funnel cake on the dining plan at all. And until the chicken coop opened last year, they didn't have a single option to add extra money to get something better off the menu. Great Adventure allows you to add $2 to add an entree at Chop 6. Nothing like that at Magic Mountain. They just take the higher tier items from the menu and then omit them off the dining plan. Like turkey legs, double burgers, or the full throttle hot dog that had the pastrami. Maybe now they'll start doing that more throughout the park now that it's at the chicken coop. The fifth pro is the fact that this park does not staple. Canada's Wonderland, Six Flags Over Texas, Six Flags Fiesta Texas, Six Flags Discovery Kingdom, please take note. I would hate to have a home park where I'm constantly battling with the ops for some airtime room. At Magic Mountain, not a problem. I rarely, if ever, end up stapled on Twisted Colossus, and I always have a ton of room on Full Throttle and Apocalypse. There's nothing dangerous about having an inch or two of room between your lap and the lap bar. There's no way that your legs are going to fly out from under the bar if the bar is not in contact with your lap. So I really hate when I read those signs that state that there needs to be contact. That's absolutely ridiculous. The manufacturers designed these rides with airtime, so the rider could actually feel the airtime. And Magic Mountain Ops are not aggressive with the lap bar. They push it down to a safe distance and don't force the issue. Knott's Berry Farm is the same way, so that's a big pro all across Southern California. The fifth con is the lack of a scheduled ride closure site. Knott's Berry Farm and Busch Gardens Tampa are two year-round parks that I know have a page on their website that shows you when they're planning to do scheduled maintenance on their ride so you can plan accordingly. I always check this site before going to Knott's because I don't want to go down there just to find out that Ghost Rider is closed. When I went to Busch Gardens, it took a lot of stress off knowing that none of their coasters were scheduled to be down the day I was supposed to be there. Magic Mountain has nothing like this. Since this is my home park, it's not a big deal for me personally, but people will come from out of town just to find that Tatsu or X2 or Twisted Colossus is closed for maintenance and they're out of luck. 
That's the danger of coming during the off season, but it doesn't seem like it would be all that hard to create a web page, listing their closure schedule, and it would be so incredibly helpful for people visiting the park. I did suggest this right after the park went year round, but I have not seen it implemented. If anyone has seen anything like this, let me know in the comments below. The sixth pro is the fact that there's four kiddie coasters. Some people may find this annoying. I think it's awesome, especially since I was able to bring my daughter up with these four coasters. Starting with Magic Flyer, moving on to Speedy Gonzales, Canyon Blaster, and then Roadrunner Express. Some parks have just one kids coaster, and some have zero. Coming to the park with your kids is so much better when they have a variety of coasters to ride. The only other park that I can think of that can rival Magic Mountain for kid-friendly coasters is Poland's Energylandia. It's not like Magic Mountain is lacking in thrill coasters. They still have 15 coasters for adults, but these kids coasters are perfectly tiered to go from mild to intermediate to advanced before they hit that 42 inch mark and can take on Ninja. The sixth con is the lack of photo purchase. When I travel around the country, almost every park either has an observation tower or a Ferris wheel. Magic Mountain has an observation tower that hasn't operated in almost a decade, and they also have no Ferris wheel. The park opened with a Ferris wheel called Galaxy, over where Buccaneer and Swashbuckler currently stand, but it was removed in 1980. They also used to have a ski lift ride which was taken out in the mid 90s. The one thing that Magic Mountain has going in its favor is the mountain that serves as the centerpiece of the park. You can get a nice perch by standing next to Superman's entrance or on Ninja's exit ramp and take some nice pictures from there. The Sky Tower was a perfect spot for pictures, but California regulations prohibit the park from opening it until it passes the test to qualify as an amusement ride. This would cost millions of dollars, and the park president said that he has not prioritized the money for that project. I hope that someday the park will do what the state wants and make the proper upgrades, even if it means it's the only addition for that year, since it would be amazing to get back up there and take pictures and video. I last went up there in 2011 and luckily got a few shots. The seventh pro is the elite top two coasters. I'm talking about Twisted Colossus and X2. These are my number seven and number 11 coasters out of 425. Twisted Colossus is a long ride packed with airtime where every single element is great. It was the first truly elite airtime machine in the state of California since none of the other parks in the state have a hyper coaster and Magic Mountain's hyper is terrible. Any RMC would have been great, but we got one of the best out there. And then there's X2, the one-of-a-kind Aero 4D coaster that was unthinkable at the time of its announcement in 2000. Despite all the problems that it's had, it's still an ultra-elite coaster 18 years later, and everyone that comes to visit Magic Mountain goes crazy over this thing, just because there's nothing like it outside of Asia. It may be the most intense coaster I've ever ridden. It's definitely the wildest coaster I've ever ridden. Some parks like Canada's Wonderland and Carowinds were given a Hyper and a Giga as their big two, which are great, but they are similar rides. It's nice that Magic Mountain has two elite coasters that are completely different from each other. The seventh and final con is the lack of transportation rides. Magic Mountain is a big park, and it's actually unbelievable that they no longer have a real transportation ride. Most parks have a train, a monorail, or a chairlift, but not Magic Mountain. At least, not anymore. The park was packed with transportation rides when it opened, but they started dropping off one by one. I mentioned the Eagle's Flight Ski Lift. This had two directions from the top of the mountain. The one that dropped you off by Modern Day Riddler's Revenge closed in 1981. The one that dropped you off by Modern Day Goliath closed in 1994. The Metro Monorail could take you all around the park with three stations. One by the Full Throttle Sports Bar, one by Modern Day Curzanity, and one in the Full Throttle Tunnel. This stopped operating in 2001 and stood dormant until 2011. There were two trams that took you up and down the mountain. One was a cable railway called the Dragon, and it took you from the Jetstream area all the way up to modern day Ninja Station, and this was closed in 1981. The other was a funicular, and that's the only transportation ride that still exists today, now called the Helpful Honda Express, and it takes you from the carousel in the front of the park up to Ninja's entrance. The park just never felt the need to replace the old transportation rides. I guess they just want us to walk everywhere. The eighth and final and best pro is the coaster collection. It's debatable whether Magic Mountain is a top five park in the country, but its coaster collection is undoubtedly top five. I think that only Cedar Point outclasses it. You could make an argument for Six Flags Great America and Hershey Park, but with 19 coasters, there's an endless collection to choose from. After that elite top two, there's not much of a drop off with the next year of coasters. Tatsu, West Coast Racers, Full Throttle, and Apocalypse. And from there, 
you still have a ton of quality coasters like Riddler's Revenge, Batman the Ride, Ninja, Superman, Viper, and I guess some people enjoy Scream and Goliath. This is a masterful collection of solid coasters. And even though Cedar Point has a more quality collection, I'm not complaining. It's crazy to think that a first timer can come to the park, skip all the kids coasters, and still walk out with 15 credits. Magic Mountain continues to add new coasters every three to four years, and will soon be the first park in the world to have 20 coasters. Those are my pros and cons of Magic Mountain, a top five park for me, and the park that I visit far and away more than anyone else. Let me know what you think about my list in the comments below, and tell me what your favorite and least favorite things are about the park. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.